All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending my talk. Um, I'm Antoine, and I'm a software engineer at Datadog, working in one of the infrastructure groups that takes care of like service-to-service -service communication. Um, and I'm going to talk about our experience adapting an, ex an existing XDS control plane from, from um, built for Envoy to gRPC. Uh, so just a few words about the company. Uh, we are an observability product with a bunch of uh, sub-products and integrations. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, we have a fairly large user base, which means that we have uh, a sizable infrastructure to support it. Uh, I'll start with a little bit of background on what is service discovery. Uh, so in its simplest form, service discovery just turns a human readable name into a list of IP addresses uh, that networking applications can then use uh, to uh, connect to a service. Uh, and by far, the most common way to do service discovery is to use DNS. Uh, DNS is an old protocol. You give it a name, it gives you an IP address or a list of IP ad addresses, and it's supported by most infrastructures. Uh, an, al an alternative to that is to use XDS. XDS is an API originally created for Envoy, um, and it has a very rich set of features. Uh, so in a way, you can think of it as a replacement for DNS with a lot, of, lot more features. Uh, so in the last few years, gRPC added support to do service discovery uh, directly through XDS. Uh, how, how do we do service discovery at Datadog? So historically, we've been using uh, the cloud provider DNS APIs uh, to uh, provide cross-cluster information in our Kubernetes infra infrastructure. Uh, there's no like really uh, less built-in way to do cross-cluster discovery. Uh, the way it works is that there are some processes that uh, write all endpoints that are spawned in the Kubernetes clusters, and uh, we wrote them into the cloud provider DNS API. Uh, this worked, but this had two main problems. Uh, one is that uh, when a large number of pods were created in a short period of time, we would start to get rate limits, uh, and uh, you know, this would make the propagation time kind of uh, unpredictable. Uh, and for some client applications, uh, you don't really control when they are going to be resolved for, from DNS. Uh, so here's a baseline for endpoint propagation was really uh, the problem that we were trying to solve um, because it slowed down deployments. And in some cases, it even uh, caused some outages as the DNS information was just out of date compared to what was happening in the da data centers. Uh, so in order to solve these problems, uh, we replaced the cloud provider APIs with our own data store. Uh, this works around the API rate limit that we were hitting, uh, and it gave us predictable uh, endpoint propagation time. Uh, and in addition to that, it also gave us the opportunity to start customizing uh, the serving path. And so, for example, we started storing the availability zone uh, of each endpoint in addition to, uh, to just the, the endpoint IP address. And it started let, letting us uh, serve more interesting queries, such as like, give me the endpoints in, in my availability zone, uh, which can cut on uh, like cross, uh, cross AZ costs. Um, like cloud providers typically charge for that. Um, and finally, this lets us start experimenting with delivering uh, the, the updates through uh, a different protocol. In the case of Envoy uh, that we used for standalone proxies, uh, this meant XDS. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. Um, how, so how does that end, impact uh, endpoint propagation time? So uh, DNS has a pool-based model uh, with caching at various layers, and when to re-resolve is left to uh, the application. In the case of gRPC, uh, we re-resolve whenever uh, a TCP connection is closed. Uh, that's a reasonable behavior to have, but it's like not the best in, in, within the data center. Um, XDS, on the other hand, is a push-based model. So uh, the control plane decides when uh, to send updates and when uh, data planes are going to use the new IP addresses. So that sh should give you faster propagation time, right? Well, it turns out that um, when there are a lot of endpoints churning, which typically happens uh, in deployments, sometimes we have tens of pods rolling at the same time. Uh, if you're pushing every single update, you're going to burn the control plane and the data plane. Uh, they're going to start doing a lot of work. So you, you, you have to introduce some form of uh, batching here in order to make that more efficient, uh, which introduce, introduces a new delay. Uh, so with this batching in place and the rest of the overhead in the system, uh, we landed in an order of 
20 seconds for propagation time. So how does that fare against DNS? Well, because we control the whole DNS stack, uh, we were able to set really low TTLs, and um, we were also able to roll out some custom resolver resolvers from 4GRPC, uh, which poll every five seconds. So in the case of DNS, uh, for us, we also ended up uh, with propagation times that was actually quite acceptable, like a bit longer than uh, XDS. So I'm mentioning this because when I talk with folks that uh, are looking at implementing XDS, uh, I often get faster propagation time as like an advantage. In our case, that wasn't really a key benefit. Uh, so let's talk about the real benefits of using XDS over DNS now, which is uh, the data models that XDS provides. So A records uh, in DNS uh, have very simplistic data structure. Uh, there's only so much an application can do uh, with that. On the other hand, uh, XDS give, gives you a much richer data model. Uh, you can start grouping endpoints by locality, give them priorities, weights, and metadata, and, and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also a bunch of other resources that you can deliver through XDS that lets you configure other aspects of uh, data plane load balancers. Uh, and in order to configure those more advanced aspects, uh, we built our own internal APIs that kind of, kind of resembles the uh, Kubernetes Gateway APIs for those that are familiar with that. And we use that mostly for our standalone proxies. Um, this lets us leverage some features of Envoy, uh, like the automatic failover uh, to, that prefers the local zones and will only use endpoints in other zones when there are failures in the local zone. Um, we also use that for configuring routes, which is like a very typical thing to do for a reverse proxy. Uh, you definitely want to have that on a self-serve basis for your users. Uh, we also use it for sharding in some places. Uh, the idea here is that uh, you look at the content of the request and you will route it to the right endpoint depending on what it con contains. Um, and we also use things like endpoint weights um, and one of the main use cases uh, for them is overload testing. Uh, you can ramp, you, you'd ramp up the weight of a single endpoint until it shows signs of overload, and that will kind of give you a baseline for what a given server can handle. Uh, all of these features we use with Envoy. Uh, so I'm still talking about Envoy here, just to be clear. Uh, the common theme for all of these features is that they require changes in configuration at runtime, so you definitely need some form of control plane for this. Uh, so envoys are not the only place where we do load balancing in our infrastructure, and in fact, we have a lot of uh, gRPC applications, and they form the majority of places where, where service-to-service -service communication occurs. Um, so our starting point here is we, in, we use DNS for service discovery uh, and lots of conf, uh, coding, code and configuration um, that we bundle directly in applications. The first thing we tried uh, was to replace the gRPC built-in load balancer with an Envoy proxy, Sidecar. Uh, if you've been following the CNCF ecosystem, this is a very popular approach that is used by most uh, off-the-shelf um, service meshes. And the idea here is, is simple. Uh, you run all of your traffic through um, a local proxy that will take care of routing and load balancing. Uh, and we offer an approach like this for our teams internally. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that you get all of these features that we had for standalone proxies uh, that, like, with no customizations to the control plane, basically. You get them for free. Um, but it also comes with some drawbacks. Uh, the first one is UX. Uh, because of the way uh, Envoy is dealing with, um, with uh, XDS resources, you kind of have to declare the dependencies uh, of your service externally. And like for people migrating to our sidecar-based approach, that was kind of a major uh, so pain to actually list those. Um, the second problem is that you have to allocate resources uh, properly for your sidecar. This is like kind of a limitation of Kubernetes, but it's a very practical one for us. Uh, you have to allocate the right amount of CPU and memory to the sidecar. Um, and so as you can see on the bottom graph, which is a heat map of like how much CPU uh, the sidecar is using, um, you, there's no one size fits all. Uh, if you allo allocate too much, uh, you will to all the sidecars, you're going to end up wasting a lot of resources across your fleet. If you don't allocate enough, then some, uh, ap some applications will suffer because they don't have enough, um, enough resources allocated to the sidecar. Um, and the, another problem is that there is an inherent cost uh, to a user-led network hop. 
so this is a gra graph actually uh, advertising the performance of Linkerd, which is in, in green. Uh, it adds a bit of latency, less than Istio, which is another service mesh. Uh, but the blue line is really like when you see that, uh, for sure, this is the thing that you want your uh, like your applications are going to want that. This is uh, the baseline without a service mesh. So for us, it was especially given that our system has like a kind of a large fan out. Uh, the requests tend to go through a lot of hops in order to be served. This is, was clearly not acceptable to roll that approach everywhere. Um, so in many scenarios, this won't matter, but for, for us, it really mattered. Uh, we also found that people were generally less likely to successfully tr troubleshoot um, the system with the sidecar in place. And we've had engineers that uh, you know, customize, tend to customize the RPC quite heavily, and that were also kind of bothered by the load balancing externalized because they couldn't get the same level of control that you get when you, when you uh, customize the load balancer in your application directly. All right, so sidecar approach um, worked for some user, is very useful in some specific cases, uh, but really for a lot of applications for us, uh, the, the cons clearly outweighed the pros. At the same time, our users really want those features that I listed before, so uh, that brings me to uh, proxyless. So the idea here is that uh, instead of having sidecar source service discovery information from XDS, we connect gRPC directly to the control plane and get some of these features. Uh, it's very compelling in, on paper. In practice, it turned out not to be as easy as we thought. Uh, so the first set of changes that we had to make was uh, to our control plane was to support the transport protocol that is used by gRPC. Um, this, the transport protocol is how the control plane and the data plane communicate resources rather than what um, these resources con contain. And so one of the specificity of uh, how Envoy works is that on startup, it will go to the control plane and it will query for all resources that it needs. And it's the responsibility of the control plane to know what uh, this specific Envoy uh, instance um, needs. Um, and you know, this is also one of the reasons for this UX difference, uh, this UX problems that we were seeing, that were, I was mentioning before. Um, so, this is uh, different from how gRPC works. Uh, gRPC uh, will wait for your application to actually create some clients and send RPCs to them to lazily go and fetch the things that you need, uh, which is actually very nice on the control plane side because you don't have to have knowledge of these applications. They will just come and ask for what they need. Uh, we had to change our control plane, which had this assumption that it needs to know everything about the nodes uh, in order to properly deal with, with gRPC for this. Um, Okay. Second problem that we ran into with the tran transport protocol was uh, with the, the, trans the, the variant of the transport. Uh, so there are two variants of the XDS protocol. One is state of the world, which is older version. Uh, and another one is a newer, more efficient variant called Delta, where you can actually, you don't have to resend all the resources for clusters and listeners. Um, so like, I'm not gonna get into details of what they, what they are exactly. Uh, but the important thing is that um, gRPC only supports state of the world, and our control plane only supported delta. So that was something that we also had to, uh, to, to address. And here the problem really is that we use Go control plane, which is kind of the reference implementation of a control plane. Um, and its implementation of the state of the world made a lot of assumptions on how uh, Envoy works and uh, was really broken uh, when connected to gRPC. So, um, we addressed all this problem. I mean, one of my colleagues, uh, Valerian Roche, actually went and fixed all of this. Uh, it's available in our fork, which is public. Uh, he's also a maintainer of Go Control Plane, so hopefully those changes eventually make it in, the, in, in, in upstream. Uh, so another thing that we had to change was the uh, configuration itself, uh, and that was kind of expected. Um, Envoy is a proxy, so we need to tell it, uh, for example, what ports it needs to listen on and how to route requests to uh, the route, right destination uh, when they enter the proxy. Uh, gRPC is different, it's not a proxy, uh, so it has a different kind of uh, listener that is kind of a special listener uh, that says that you know, it's just a gRPC client. Um, so that was a simple change to make. Uh, but it wasn't the only change. Uh, we also had actually had to change a lot of resources because either gRPC implemented just a subset of the features that we needed or it implemented it in a slightly different way. 
uh, or in the case of security features, for example, uh, it would outright reject the configurations as we had it uh, for Envoy uh, because, uh, you know, because, because gRPC only implements a subset of these uh, features, uh, it actually doesn't accept uh, the, to get a configuration that it doesn't understand. That makes a lot of sense to do that for security features, right? You don't want to ship a configuration to a data plane. It doesn't understand it, but it still tries to apply it. Uh, but still, it meant work on us uh, to kind of like, you know, ship configurations that was comp compatible with gRPC. Uh, so to summarize where we're at now with this work that has been done, uh, so on the good side, um, we had we have a bunch of features that uh, like we were successfully able to implement, like the traffic shifting, per path and header-based routing, uh, and ability to kind of central centrally control what load balancers in, is used by each. Um, by each gRPC instance, by, by all clients. There's very solid uh, cross-language support, actually, which was really important for us. Uh, Java, Go, and Python are, are heavily used internally. Uh, we have more and more JavaScript as well. Uh, the, while implementing that, like uh, the designs for all these features is very thorough. Uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, the specifications are explaining all the, how, how these features work in great details. As an aside, like sometimes uh, the hard part of reading the GRFCs is really kind of understanding the motivation for certain features. Um, I mean, if you don't understand why you might need something, probably you just don't need it, but um, yeah. So you still retain the ability to use custom load balancers. This is something that was actually really important to us uh, because uh, we are rolling out like some custom features there. Uh, like the pit balancer that uh, Sergey talked about uh, earlier today. Uh, on the less positive side, um, there's a lot of features that we were using in Envoy that are actually not implemented in gRPC. Uh, for example, we use pro pro over pro a feature called over-provisioning for zonal failover, uh, which um, you know, gRPC doesn't support. You kind of have to like, implement more things on the, on the control plane here. Uh, we use load balancing subset metadata for sharding. If you're familiar with like those that have played a lot with Envoy might know about this feature. Uh, it's also another feature that is not uh, available for, for gRPC. So the sharding stuff, uh, we, we haven't yet adapted to, uh, to gRPC. Uh, endpoint weight is, is another example of a feature that is not yet, not yet implemented in gRPC. Um, another thing is that uh, some features that are available through re the resolver abstraction become inaccessible as you are using XDS. Uh, so, and there are two, they fall into two ca categories. Uh, one of them is those that are configured directly through the service config and that are not yet available through XDS. So you will kind of lose some, some features. I gave a few examples um, if you use XDS instead of like a custom resolver. Uh, the other sort of features that you lose is the ability to set custom endpoint metadata. Data. So if, you, if, if, you, if you're doing that, uh, XDS, the protocol, and the config has the ability to do that, but it's not actually available to a, to a custom balancer that you use through the built-in support for gRPC XDS. Um, so just to conclude, um, so there's inherent difference um, in the XDS transport, um, that was uh, you know, not really a, uh, a key benefit for us compared to, to DNS. Uh, it's really the data model uh, that is important. Uh, ad adapting our XDS control plane was actually quite uh, a big effort, really, uh, more than we anticipated. Uh, there's changes to the transport and then ch changes to the XDS resources themselves. The feature set is also quite different. Like this is clearly something that you need to research a bit. If you have an existing Envoy control plane, make sure that you f the features that you rely on uh, are implemented on the gRPC side. Uh, this is some work that was like a large part of the preliminary work that we did uh, here. Uh, and finally, you have to be aware that some of the customizations that you might be, if you're heavy on customizing gRPC, like some of those customizations that you may, may be doing might not be possible when you, when you switch to gRPC XDS. Um, and that's it. Um, I'll open it for questions. Uh, two questions. So the first is uh, just here at the end, you said that gRPC only supports the state of the world. 
uh, sort of mechanism for um, yeah, communication. Uh, is that something that's inherent to gRPC, or could could it grow support for the XDS? So I, I think it can definitely uh, have support for it. I will defer to uh, maintainers. I think Eric is probably the best person to, to answer this question, uh, really. Support for, for Delta. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so so st we really like Delta protocol. Uh -huh. uh, we've looked at it multiple times. It's just that we look at the other things we're doing, and state of the world works. Um, so it's, it's mainly to have either the time or it being important enough to, to get to. But it, it's, it's a much better protocol. And we still will have some hiccups occasionally with some details of state of the world. So um, just to be clear here, so for us, like the limitations of state of the world themselves were not really a problem. Right. Uh, I mean, it has everything we need. Uh, it's just that we, you know, like when you start a control plane for Envoy, sure. you start with Delta, right? Like that's the default now. Yeah, uh, state of the world is worse for Envoy than it is for gRPC because gRPC is subscribing to fewer resources. Um, the deficiencies of it don't show up as much. Okay, so, uh, it, so it is. It's somewhere on the roadmap. You, you just don't want to make yeah, it's just it's like just priorities and, like and stuff. We'd love to have it if cool. if, if someone came around along. Um, it'd be it'd be fabulous. We, awesome. We 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 like it. Uh, can I ask another question? Uh, the other one was, um, so oh, maybe you said it at the beginning, but I didn't catch is all the stuff that you're doing here, is that for your internal communication or is it also for your customer traffic? And yeah, it, so I was wondering whether that would be obvious or not, but uh, yes, that's all for internal infrastructure. Okay. Uh, our clients communicate with our external load balancers using DNS. Okay. Um, Thank you. So. So you said that with DNS, you were getting like a 25 second propagation time and then like with XTS, 20 seconds. What, what's the like actual cause? Or could you really get it conceivably down to zero if you had all the data available? Or are you really just trickling it down that slowly to the clients? So are you asking what causes these 20 seconds yeah. for XDS? So I talked about the batching, that you, so you kind of have to wait for, to actually emulate some updates. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just like immediately push anything that you get. It's just gonna be too costly, I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd be curious if you have other approaches that work, that cut down on the, but there's always this inherent trade-off between like trying to batch things and waiting yeah. uh, versus like whatever, you know, whatever you do, you, you always have this trade-off too. Yeah, I guess is the batching of five seconds determined by the client load, or is it determined by like? Uh, it's it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, you know, you could pr possibly a smaller value would work, just like for t for DNS. Uh, possibly a smaller TTL would work. Mm -hmm. You know, it would cause a bit more traffic, and would be a bit more work both on the data plane and control plane. Maybe acceptable. In any case, like I guess the the really the takeaway from this is that um, you know we were able to achieve a reasonable propagation time with both DNS and XDS in the end. Cool, thank so. you. I wonder if you potentially wanted to uh, decrease this propagation time with uh, gRPC workloads. Uh, would it work because uh, gRPC has to just load and uh, monitor a few resources? Uh, so I don't think that would make a difference. Uh, I think you know we have some large workloads where I, currently we push all the IPs. Uh, we don't do subsetting on the on the control plane side. So sometimes you have like hundreds of IPs in there, and sometimes they move, they change rapid, very rapidly. So yeah, whether it's gRPC client or Envoy client doesn't make a difference here. One more question, if there is one. Otherwise, uh, we can all go to happy hours, I guess. No, not yet. Ah, no, there is another keynote. Happy hour, Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>